If your country was under attack by a giant radioactive monster, what would you do? Tokyo is about to be destroyed and your government is responsible for stopping the creature in its tracks. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat Godzilla in Shin Godzilla. This country is about to face a crisis like never before. The Coast Guard spot a stranded yacht floating in Tokyo Bay, finding only some personal effects. They wonder if someone fell off the yacht and drowned. Suddenly, the sea erupts from below and massive amounts of blood bursts into this underwater highway. The government arranges a meeting to discuss what just happened, and they see on the news what looks to be a volcanic eruption at Tokyo Bay, forcing people to evacuate. The government runs through a list of possibilities, including the idea of a new volcano, but one official interrupts to say that the bay is too shallow for a volcano. Yaguchi here tells the others that their theories are all wrong. There's something in that bay. They move operations into a conference room as more and more civilians keep evacuating the area. Suddenly, the government gets word that eruption activity is dying down, but Yaguchi here calls BS on that and says that a massive creature could be behind all of this, but no one believes him. They watch another broadcast and see a giant tail come out of the ocean. The government is split between wanting to kill this creature as soon as possible or capture it for research. This lady analyzes the video and thinks that it may be capable of walking on land. The government then decides to tell the world, according to experts, it cannot come onto land. It would crush its under its own weight and tells the world to remain calm. But that's when this thing, now destroying anything on either side of the Nomi River, gets out of the water and onto land, wrecking havoc in the city and thousands of people run for their lives. Okay, the government was way too calm about everything leading up to this, but if you think about it, their calm reaction to the events leading up to this actually makes sense. Why? Japan is one of the few countries located above what is called the Ring of Fire or the Circum Pacific Belt. It's a path along the Pacific Ocean that traces the boundaries between several tectonic plates. 75% of the Earth's volcanoes, more than 450 of them, are located along this area. A large portion of the planet's most violent acts happen here. Japan is no slouch when it comes to dealing with natural disasters, since the archipelago is situated along this ring of fire. This country is vulnerable to natural disasters, such as earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanic eruptions. In fact, Japan is so used to all of this that it even has a dedicated budget and massive systems in place to deal with all of this. They have earthquake resistant buildings that move with the earthquakes, which means that everything these guys have experienced up to this point was pretty much just another regular Tuesday, minus the giant ugly monster crushing its way through the city streets and ruining people's lives. This video is brought to you by Manscaped.com, the premium global brand for men's grooming and hygiene products. But check it. It's Friday night, and you've got a hot day with Michiko Melandru or Satoru Goju. Whatever tickles your fancy. Either way, you're gonna need to keep those weeb hairs trimmed if you want your fancy's tickle come end of the night. That's why Manscaped sent me the Performance Package 4.0 All-in-One Grooming Kit for Body Hair Removal. Whoopla! Lawnmower 4.0 Travel Trimmer. Waterproof, cordless, wireless charging, and contain whatever ungodly fluff you throw at it. We're talking replaceable ceramic blades with skin-safe tech on this bad boy. No mess, no cuts, no nicks. Because the last time I tried shaving south of my Grand Canyon, I nicked some soft spots. But this LED spotlight will light up your soft spots and have your hard to reach places ready for whatever happens after that hot date of yours. Now, fun fact about me is I collect watches. This is my next pick, 21 jewels. It's nice, right? Well, too bad for us guys we've only got two jewels, and I'm talking about your family jewels, gentlemen. Your balls. So you gotta take care of them. Because the Performance Package 4.0 also includes a crop preserver, which you can apply on your sweet money makers after the shower for all day body odor protection. And top it off with the Crop Reviver for a midday refresh sesh. All this will make your wrinkly raisin sack look more sexy than my watch collection. Ah oh, shit, is that a nose hair? Well, with the Weed Whacker, you don't gotta worry about it. This thing is like the 4.0 lawnmower, but for your nose. If this can handle my big schnoz, it can handle yours too. And my love language is gift giving. Just kidding, it's gift receiving. So for a limited time, when you get the 4.0 performance package, you'll get two free gifts. This luxury leather, water-resistant grab-and-go shed travel bag, and these super comfortable anti-chafing box of briefs to house that nasty jungle eel of yours. So get your ass over to manscaped.com and get 20% off plus free shipping and two free gifts with my promo code linked down below and go to manscaped.com. Thank you to manscaped.com for sponsoring this video. Now back to the show. The creature going through tiny streets tramples everything in its path, going at a pace of 8 miles an hour, giving the government only 3 hours until it reaches 
is Tokyo City. The government in an emergency meeting quickly works on a plan. They talk about a military strike, but the area is too densely populated for them to use any heavy artillery. They then argue about the steps it would take to move everyone out of the area, knowing it would result in a massive gridlock, leaving tens of thousands of terrified people trapped. With little choice, they decide to go ahead with the evacuation, arranging for emergency personnel to help people escape on foot. The giant creature climbs onto an apartment, tips it over, and kills everyone inside. The government watches the entire thing play out and realizes that it's now or never. They authorize for defense forces to attack the creature head on, even while thousands of citizens are fleeing the area. And they need the final attack order from the Prime Minister. Government officials tell the Prime Minister that he needs to take action now or it'll be too late. Military attack helicopters are sent off and the government officials pat themselves on the back for taking care of the threat. Meanwhile, the creature stops, gets on its back legs, and collapses, sending debris and dust all over. Everyone freezes, not knowing what is going to happen next. Suddenly, it stands back up and begins evolving, rapidly gaining size and turning into a much deadlier creature and into Japan's greatest enemy, Godzilla. Now, it begins walking through the city at a much faster pace, and that's when the military arrives on the scene, taking position to gun down this deadly creature once and for all. They ready their guns to fire, but notice civilians still evacuating the city. The Prime Minister gives them orders to hold off their attack in order to ensure the safety of the remaining escapees. But that was his biggest mistake. Godzilla sprints through the buildings and heads straight back into Tokyo Bay. The government officials visit the disaster zone, shocked at the amount of damage caused in only two hours. They worry that the creature is hiding in the bay and is going to make another appearance very soon. Should a major move when it was just crawling on the ground? Now we have to decide if using munitions against Godzilla is worth human lives and the long-term effects if we don't. Upfront cost of life that we put in harm's way versus the millions of lives that Godzilla will kill the longer it remains alive. We have no way of knowing yet if our weapons will work against Godzilla, and the last thing we want to do is piss it off. But what choice do we have? We gotta do something, and we're lucky that Godzilla wasn't able to stay on land. Many sea creatures are often crushed by their own weight if they even attempt to make land, including mammals such as whales and Godzilla, it seems, is no exception. This is evident as there is little reason that Godzilla would have returned to see if it didn't have to, since it was met with basically no resistance when it made land. It is being driven exclusively by instinct, meaning it didn't go back into the sea because it was bored. It went back because it had to. We need to assume it's coming back and we need to get a move on getting ready for it. If I was them, I would quickly get over the fact that countless lives will die. But if we want our kids to have a home to return to, we have no choice. And the fact that they only used Kawasaki OH-1 Ninja Scout helicopters to take it on is insane. Yaguchi arranges an informal meeting and gathers experts of every discipline to add their two cents in regards to the apocalyptic threat at hand. They look at the three mutations of the creature, thinking there's more to come. However, they can't get a good read on it with the limited information they have. They want to know what kind of energy source could fuel a creature this big. This lady doctor suggests that Godzilla might be using nuclear energy to power Power its gargantuan frame. They begin analysis of the creature's path throughout the city and notice that it's left a path of radiation wherever it went. That's when the U.S. Deputy Chief's aide requests a meeting with Yakuchi. The Deputy Chief's aide, Kayoko, strikes a deal with Yakuchi and asks him to find a Japanese professor who knew that Godzilla was going to attack years before it ever happened. She wants them to hand over the professor in exchange for U.S. intel on the creature. Later, the government informs her that the professor's boat was found missing a few days ago and hands over the intel that they recovered from the ship. In exchange, the lady hands over her intel on Godzilla. They analyze the intel that Kayoko gave them, looking at classified photos, showing the mass dumping of radioactive materials into the ocean. The lady confirms that this is what the creature fed on to become the giant behemoth they see today. The experts discuss their new findings, discovering that Godzilla is capable of self-mutation, making it an increasingly powerful force to reckon with. However, the creature is mortal, and it can be killed. One of the experts question why it returned to Tokyo Bay, and this bald man has a realization. This creature has a biological nuclear reactor in its body, and it needs to return to the bay in order to cool off. This is beyond bad. We've got a prehistoric creature that powers itself by feeding on nuclear waste, and radiation usually isn't too nice to biological matter. It's helped with advances in medicine, academics, agriculture, archaeology, like carbon dating, geology, and even more, but all the same, radiation is scary. Because radiation is basically the emission of energy in the form 
of waves or particles through space or through a material medium, like radium, a naturally occurring radioactive metal. This stuff at high doses has the ability to damage DNA in our cells, causing a bunch of horrifying stuff to happen within the body, mutagenic effects, cellular degradation, and even organ failure. Like seriously, don't type up radiation poisoning on Google. This stuff is so volatile. The human species, along with every other species, consists of trillions of cells. Godzilla getting power from radiation means that every single one of his trillions of cells within his body would have had to mutate the exact same way, which is highly unlikely. Exhausted, Yaguchi takes a nap, but his subordinate rushes in and says that Godzilla is back. The massive creature rises from the ocean and makes its way back onto land, destroying homes, businesses, everything in its path, causing horrified civilians to run. The government watches from the meeting room and realizes something extremely worrying. The creature has nearly doubled in size. The analytics still project that Godzilla will reach Tokyo metropolitan area in three hours, and the government officials fear that it might be headed towards a nuclear facility on the way, which would result in a large-scale massive disaster that would last decades crippling the country. Great, just great. Now it wants a nuclear snack for dessert. Japan is no slouch when it comes to nuclear energy. This type of energy usage has been a national priority for them since 1973. In fact, from 1970 onwards, Japan has only quadrupled their nuclear power capacity to the point where up until 2011, Japan was generating some 30% of electricity from its reactors with plans to only increase until the Fukushima accident, of course, which kind of threw a wrench into that plan. As of 2022, Japan has 33 nuclear power reactors classed as operable, meaning that Godzilla has plenty to choose from. This animal is driven by instinct. Unless we can find out the path of least resistance for him and in which direction he's headed, we don't know which power plant to protect from him. Because shutting down a power plant, removing the nuclear fuel from the reactor itself, the whole process can take seven years for the whole area to be rendered inoperable and harmless. Everyone panics, knowing what's about to come. They beg the Prime Minister to let them fire at the creature, and finally the Prime Minister announces that they're clear to commence attack. The command center declares the city of Kawasaki a battleground, getting ready for all-out war. Ground forces begin gathering, and they're briefed on the radioactive material present on Godzilla's head and legs. The choppers arrive on the scene, and they're given the order to fire. Instantly, a barrage of bullets drill Godzilla in the face, but it has no effect. The chopper squad switches their ammo to higher artillery bullets, but still nothing. Godzilla pushes forward, getting closer to Tokyo. The command center is shocked to see that 16,000 bullets hasn't left a mark, so they have the choppers take position and fire missiles right at the creature's face. A cloud of black smoke covers Godzilla, but he emerges with no visible signs of damage. Seeing this, the command center shifts to phase two of their defense plan. The ground tanks aim and all fire at the same time, shooting their weapons onto its lower body and notice that Godzilla is slowing down. They're onto something. On the count of three, they commence artillery fire and engage all forces onto the creature simultaneously, and the command center moves onto phase three. They launch an all-out aerial assault, bringing fighter jets in to drop bombs from above. The entire city shakes from the impact, and the jets continue to throw heavy fire, while Godzilla throws a part of the bridge into the air, landing right next to the command center. Suddenly, it emerges from the debris with seemingly no injuries. The government decides that the best option is to suspend operations. The attack was a failure, and Godzilla is still getting closer to Tokyo. The officials begin to realize that the Japanese defense force is not strong enough to take on the creature by itself. They need outside help, and they decide to reach out to the U.S. for aid. The U.S. replies instantly, proposing a bombing zone that will kill tens of thousands of civilians instantly if they're not evacuated in time. That's when one of the officials confronts the prime minister and tells him that he needs to leave now. Godzilla is coming their way, and they need to get out of here. Really? That's what we're gonna do. Japan's security treaty with the U.S. has been in effect since the 1960s. These two nations are committed to defending each other if one of them is attacked. The U.S. has over 20 U.S. military bases located in and around Japan, but this solution could be worse than dealing with Godzilla ourselves. The U.S. wants to take him out with a couple of B-2 Spirit bombers, which is a heavy strategic bomber designed at taking out anti-aircraft defenses and is capable of delivering both conventional and nuclear munitions. This bomber, aside from nuclear munitions, has the ability to hold up to 60,000 pounds of explosives, which for scale in simple terms, a bomb is often identifiable by its weight, and even the simplest of bombs within the 2,000 pound range of explosives will usually carry around about 940-ish pounds of some type of explosive charge, ranging from TNT, RDX, and ammonium nitrate or something else. The blast from a 2,000 pound charge will be enough to carve a crater 50 feet across and around 16 feet deep into the ground. All of this from just a simple 2,000 pound explosive charge and a 
single B-2 Spirit Bomber will be capable of creating this much destruction times 30. It won't be possible to evacuate all the citizens in time, which means their only options is to have some sort of miracle and survive in the Japan Metro Tunnel. And the problem with that is that most of the subway stations simply won't work due to the fact that they are shallow. Most of the metros underground in Japan do not surpass 30 meters deep. This means that Japan is simply not prepared for the creative destruction and nuclear capabilities that Godzilla is capable of. And neither will they be able to survive if those B-2 spirit bombers decide to rain down hell on Godzilla in any sort of significant way. Dropping warheads onto a walking nuclear reactor doesn't seem like a good plan. It would decimate Japan. Godzilla now in Meguro City, almost the doorstep to the heart of Tokyo. Yaguchi and the others make their way out, but the entire city is under gridlock. They exit the car and hear bomb-like sounds in the distance. The gigantic creature's footsteps are deafening. Yaguchi's buddy tells him that the US bomb strikes are coming earlier than expected. That's when the bombs hit, and they watch as the US firepower causes massive bleeding to Godzilla. The creature screams out in pain, and Yaguchi notices that it's beginning to glow a purple hue. No one has any idea what's going on, when suddenly it bends over and volcanic smog shoots out of its mouth, filling the city. In a matter of seconds, it sets the smog on fire and destroys everything on the ground. Godzilla lifts its head upwards, turning its fiery breath into a terrifying beam of light, demolishing the bomber from above, and more bombers head towards it. But Godzilla isn't done. Firing more beams of light from its back, it destroys the bombers and the munitions they've dropped down, and continues to set the city on fire. Yaguchi watches in awe, and his buddy tells him to head underground. The next day, the news reports that radiation has spread throughout the entire city of Kawasaki and beyond. The Prime Minister has gone missing, and they need to find a replacement as soon as possible. Yaguchi and his buddy walks into the new government headquarters located in Tachigawa City. He demands to know the current location of Godzilla and is told that it's currently inactive near Tokyo Station, and the areas around the creature are now highly contaminated, making it impossible for anyone to get near it. The Minister of Agriculture is announced as the new Prime Minister. Yaguchi gathers the experts one last time, giving them a pep talk and tells them that they must stop the deadly creature, and gives them live samples of the creature for research. Kayoko arrives to inform them that other countries would like to get involved in the fight. Yaguchi meets with foreign experts, and they watch as a floating surveillance system closes in on Godzilla, but loses signal before they can get a good look at the creature. The foreign expert explains that it may have something similar to a built-in phase radar, allowing it to intercept incoming objects. This keeps getting worse and worse? Godzilla has a built-in radar. That's a problem. We as humans use phased array radar systems for military and non-military purposes. The radar system was developed for use in military radar systems, steering a beam of radio waves into the sky to quickly detect planes and missiles. This explains how Godzilla knew and was able to defend itself when the military tried to attack it earlier. Now we also know that Godzilla is not only capable of releasing nuclear energy, but it's also leaking nuclear waste wherever it goes. At this point, aside from what the government is trying to do to combat Godzilla, what they need to figure out how to do is to move him away from the city. If Godzilla keeps leaking nuclear waste all over Tokyo, there won't be a city left to live in. A group goes and inspects the disaster zone and notices the remains of Godzilla hanging from above. The experts analyze it and find that the remains are capable of becoming their own living organisms. Yaguchi and Kayoko meet up to discuss a very important matter. The White House wants to use a giant nuclear warhead to take out Godzilla. If it isn't stopped, the creature might make its way to American shores and become a global crisis. Kayoko tells him that the bomb they're going to use will be 75 times stronger than the one dropped on Hiroshima. The Prime Minister tells his subordinates that there's not much they can do, and asks them for permission to go ahead with a nuclear strike. His subordinates are shocked, knowing that this will affect Tokyo and Japan for decades to come. The government gives the United States the go-ahead to vaporize Tokyo, and the experts suggest that there's only two choices to make, blow it up with a nuke and suffer the consequences, or freeze it with a newly formulated drug. However, creating this drug will require 672 kilometers of coagulation. Yaguchi demands that they find a way and they get to work, and they call all the chemical companies in the country, hoping to find a way to make this less dangerous option work out. The Prime Minister and his subordinates meet again, bringing news about Godzilla. In 15 days, the creature will move again, and he'll be even deadlier than before. Hearing this news, the American government gives them a two-week grace period before dropping the bombs. Now they have to evacuate 3.6 million people from the Tokyo metropolitan area. Okay, Godzilla will resume activity in 15 days, and the US is saying that Japan has two weeks to evacuate 3.6 million people from the area? Are they nuts? The resources and efforts necessary will be immense, and even then, where would they go? You're going to need a huge amount of housing and food to care for these
these people for a long time. We need all modes of transportation, both military and civilian, to take as many people as far away from Tokyo as possible. The US, since it's their great idea to incinerate all of Tokyo, have bases all over Japan, and they can lend us their planes and ships as well. It's the least they can do. This bomb they're going to drop on Tokyo is 75 times stronger than the bomb Little Boy, which was dropped on Hiroshima. The death toll is going to be catastrophic either way. Moving millions of people is not easy. The largest evacuation by a civil airliner, for example, was the moving of 170,000 people from Amman to Bombay during the Persian Gulf War. And this evacuation took nearly two months. We got two weeks. Even if we're talking about the evacuation within the country, places like Tokyo are going to be unable to do this within two weeks, at least humanely, unless some type of big international military effort aid was given. Later on, Yaguchi continues to look at the intel about the Japanese professor that knew about Godzilla. The professor's wife died of radiation sickness, so he made it his life's work to make radioactive material harmless. But they can't figure out the research he left behind, wondering why there are lines drawn all over it. That's when the older expert takes another look at the origami lying on the table and realizes something extraordinary. The experts get to work, figuring out that the professor's research paper turns into a molecular chart when folded like origami. With the scientific details figured out, they find that Godzilla can convert either hydrogen or oxygen into the necessary molecules to keep its body heated up and ready for action. Using supercomputers, they solve the professor's riddle and take a look at the scientific data. They find out that the blood coagulation plan, freezing Godzilla from the inside out, is possible. Yaguchi's buddy confronts the prime minister, asking him to step aside so they can try out the less deadly blood coagulation plan. The prime minister disagrees, telling them that the US wants to get the issue over and done with as soon as possible. However, later realizing that Yaguchi's plan will result in less death and destruction, he changes his mind. With two days left until the grace period is over, Yaguchi's crew realizes that they need three days to formulate the drugs. Yaguchi and Kayoko make an agreement, with Kayoko supplying whatever weapons and equipment necessary to undergo the coagulation plan. With hours until the creature reawakens, Yaguchi gathers troops and informs them that they'll be heading to the disaster zone where Godzilla awaits. He warns them that some may not make it back and that the future of Japan is in their hands. Okay, this is it. It's the final countdown. Godzilla is capable of rapidly evolving to compensate and rid itself of any weaknesses. And this is how the military hasn't been able to defeat it yet. Godzilla's blood and dorsal spikes act as a natural cooling system for its body. And this blood coagulant that they're gonna try and stick Godzilla with will ideally interrupt his blood cooling system with the intent of freezing his body from within, rendering him immobile, so to speak. And while this plan does seem to have some risk, it's the only thing that we've got that won't render Japan and possibly the whole world unlivable. The US plans to use a thermonuclear bomb on Godzilla that's 75 times stronger than the one dropped on Hiroshima. And here's the thing, the Americans seem to need to pound a nail with a sledgehammer instead of just a regular hammer. Common sense will tell us that based on what we've seen as to how Godzilla reacts to radiation, one of two things will happen. The bomb will drop and will either make Godzilla thrive off of the nuclear blast, resulting in this creature having even more terrifying power, or the bomb will cause Godzilla to receive too much energy, making him unstable and could result in everything around him being in danger of radioactive poisoning. Can you imagine detonating the world's most powerful nuclear warhead weapon on top of the world's most dangerous, walking, living, breathing nuclear reactor Godzilla? It's not gonna end well. And while this act may take down Godzilla, it could take everything else down with it, resulting in a nuclear meltdown of sorts the likes of which the world has never seen. I'm just saying, the smartest thing we could do is to try the blood coagulation plan and see if it works. Arriving at Tokyo, they enact a curfew on the entire city and put the coagulation plan into motion. They send train cars to Godzilla's immobile body, blowing them up and waking the sleeping beast. That's when the Air Force arrives, dropping bombs, but they're destroyed by his laser beams, but the planes keep on coming in order to waste its energy. They then notice that the beams have stopped discharging, but then Godzilla shoots laser beams from its tail and mouth, and suddenly the creature runs out of energy and the laser beams stop. Yaguchi's team blows up the buildings around it, forcing it to fall to the ground. They send out more missiles to take out bigger buildings, burying Godzilla. The crane platoon makes their entrance and gathers around the creature's mouth to administer pressure into its body. That's when it wakes up and takes out the entire platoon, but Yaguchi here has a backup plan. He sends off more train bombs to hit the creature, with the second and third crane platoons arriving on the scene. They finish administering the oxygen, but Godzilla reawakens with killer intent. Suddenly, the creature freezes in place, and the mission is a success. Later on, Yaguchi's subordinate congratulates him on the gargantuan effort. He informs him that the entire cabinet is resigning, meaning Japan
Japan will soon have another election take place, with Yaguchi having a strong case to become the new Prime Minister. But what did you think about Shin Godzilla? Let us know what you like and what you didn't like. Don't forget to subscribe, leave a thumbs up, and as always, don't forget to check out our How to Beat playlist.